Well, welcome everyone again. This is the second meeting of the technical advisory group for scenario planning in the Flagstaff Regional Plan. Melissa, do you have anything you want to say before we get started? Just to say thanks again to everyone who's joining. And yes, I have a puffy on because it's um, a little cool where I am right now, so, but I'm not outside. <laughs> The, we start meetings for the city of Flagstaff with our land acknowledgement. The city of Flagstaff humbly acknowledges the ancestral homelands of this area's indigenous nations and original stewards. These lands still inhabited by native descendants border mountains sacred to indigenous people. We honor them, their legacies, their traditions, and their continued contributions. We celebrate their past, present, and future generations who will forever know this place as home. And then Io, are you gonna, are you ready to jump in? I know you were having some technical issues. Yes, yeah, I'm, oops, sorry about that. Um, yeah, happy to jump in. I, I think, uh, did you want me to take it from this slide then? Is that what you're? Oh, is a slide for sure. Um, either way, just a, this is a quick reminder on the screen of the fact that this is a technical group, you're advising staff, um, while we're recording these for transparency, there's no quorum requirement, and um, we have feedback loops built into this process, both with the public and staff, so those who aren't present with us can participate. Um, and I'm always the contact if there's any questions of how that's working or people want to give feedback. Go ahead, Io. Thank you. Yeah, so on the next slide uh, should be our agenda for today. Um, yeah, I am one of the people who has, is experiencing technical difficulties. So um, luckily, though, we have a, a, a strong bench here. So thanks, Sachi, for taking this. Um, and Stein will be doing a little more of the presenting and facilitation today. So, but today, like um, Sarah mentioned, we're going to be staying as a large group. Um, and um, getting up to speed on kind of project updates at a high level, um, being introduced to a very preliminary business as usual overview, uh, which leads us right into kind of um, how that relates to our discussion from our first TAG meeting, uh, how we summarized that, both the, the comments we received within the TAG group, but then the ones we got asynchronously from city county staff and you know, other observers in the public. Um, and that will really feed us into our first large group discussion where we can kind of see what critical uncertainties rose to the top and how do we really, um, which ones do we really want to focus on um, that we cannot miss when we start to plan for developing scenarios. Um, the next, um, we'll take a little break after that and then we'll jump into kind of um, performance metrics, how do we know that scenarios are, how they're doing? So we'll have a discussion on how do we evaluate scenarios, what kind of indicators are important for that? Um, and that'll be kind of our first conversation and it won't be our last, but that'll be what we wanna use the second half of our time for before we talk about next steps for the pro project overall, which will include our first um, wave of meetings with the public. So you'll learn about those uh, meetings that are scheduled at this point. Um, and then we'll wrap up for the day. So um, we'll keep moving. Just a reminder, because this will be a very heavy discussion-based conversation that, you know, we, we all know how to play well um, in this, but um, it's good to be reminded about, you know, we're scenario planning is exploratory process. Uh, we can consider multiple truths and we're not debating to win. Uh, please be mindful about kind of how you participate in this uh, conversation. You've all been convened here because you are experts in your arena. So I hope that that you to remind you of that and to step step in and step <laughs> up into the conversation. We have our little notes on the side here and know what um, your wheelhouses are. So don't be surprised if we might um, at a certain point during parts of the conversation call upon people to say, you know, this is your wheelhouse. How do you, what are you, what's your latest thinking on this? So that'll happen today. Um, also be mindful if you, if you are very excited and are participating a lot in the conversation to stand, step back and make space for others to talk. Um, this is kind of the benefit of us all being together is hearing from multiple people. 
Um, if you have questions or comments, uh, use that preface in the chat to put a Q or a C if you want to add that in, and we'll have folks monitoring the chat just as last time. Um, I think that's it, and we can keep it moving here. Um, this is just a reminder that just like we did with the first tag meeting, the this meeting is being recorded and will be posted for people to comment and watch asynchronously. Um, I think we all agreed that that was um, you know, a process that everyone was comfortable with. This is just a reminder. Um, keep, we can keep it moving here. Now, a quick project update. Um, we, oh, thanks, Alex. I realized you're moving the slides. Um, we are gonna go over a, a very, uh, we've been working on the preliminary business as usual scenario and are excited to kind of share what our assumptions were that went into that um, and kind of give you a preview of that. Um, and since our last meeting, we've been doing a lot of stakeholder analysis and mapping out, you know, who is the universe of stakeholders we want to make sure to engage at the relevant times throughout this project. Uh, an important group are community-based partners who will be helping us with reaching harder to reach communities and populations. And so we're excited to share that those wheels have been in progress and we've uh, started to re make first contact with all of the CBO partners we'd like to invite um, um, early in the process of scenario planning. Um, and then lastly, we'll hear a little bit more about this later. Uh, we've been working on this Face the Future flag staff, which is kind of a, a novel way of helping introduce the idea of scenario planning, long range planning to folks in a game format. Um, and that, that will be used during these public meetings and with CBO partners. Um, and so we'll share kind of what our latest um, progress has been on that and get your thoughts uh, before we wrap up today. I think that's it. Uh, we can keep moving. And I think this is now, I'm gonna pass it over to Alex to present. All right, we don't wanna have the, the echo chamber. Um, effect going on here. But hi, everyone. Uh, Alex Steinberger with Cascadia Partners. Um, and I am excited to share a couple of developments in this project. And I'll also be walking us through uh, much of the uh, much of the discussion today. Um, but first, let's start with a very preliminary just update on a very important component of this project, which is developing a what we call a business as usual scenario. And uh, so what is a business as usual scenario? Why do we need it for this project? It assumes a plausible amount of growth um, based on uh, state forecasts being um, built out in the region um, at densities and in mixes of uses that are similar to the development patterns that we've seen um, in, in the recent past. And so it's kind of like, a, what if we do nothing? kind of a scenario. It establishes a baseline for us to, to create a reference against for alternative scenarios where we start testing different policies. So it assumes no changes to things like local zoning. And we were very, very cognizant of entitlements and what's what's allowed on each parcel within the study area. We didn't um, we didn't push on any of that. And it also doesn't doesn't assume any additional investments like new transit lines or new highways that we don't know about already. Um, and as I mentioned before, it's a it's helpful as a reference point for alternative scenarios to, to kind of show how much better or worse potentially different policy choices might be. Uh, and it also helps us expose some issues potentially with the way that things have been going and how they might um, conflict with some of these drivers of change that we've been talking about in the future. Um, and then finally, it's a really important tool to help members of the public understand um, you know, the, the trade-offs that might be associated with growing the way that we have been. It gives them something to respond to, to say, I want my scenario, I want the future of Flagstaff to look different than, than what this uh, do nothing scenario, business as usual scenario um, is, is telling us. And just a couple of notes about what we're assuming um, for that scenario. Um, and, and as we've discussed, things like population growth aren't a given for this region. 
even the state has some some very widely differing thoughts about what the future looks like. And so we've developed a, a preliminary population and employment forecast um, for the region based on the state's recently released county level population um, forecast. So all we did was we took that county level forecast and we we uh, disaggregate or we yeah disaggregated it and and assigned it uh, a, a smaller portion of it to the um, FMPO boundary, which is the study area for for the regional plan. And as you can see, th this is the quote unquote medium series, and they produce a high and a low, which haven't been released yet. But in the medium series, we're seeing very very modest growth for the county and and subsequently for the region. Um, and so the chart at the top kind of shows the, the region and the county and the city's population sort of plateauing kind of around the 2040 mark. And if you look at that as annual growth over time, you can see that growth over time pretty much um, converges around zero by the end of the horizon of the plan. So that is what we're assuming as business as usual, kind of a, a plausible scenario for the future. That's not to say that as we explore alternative scenarios that we might not dabble with assumptions about even lower population growth or higher population growth. Um, so, so that's something that we definitely wanna keep, a, keep an eye on as we go through this process. Um, here, just in case you're curious, these, this is what the, the numbers we, we came up with look like for the study area. So we're looking at you know, about uh, 30,000 additional people and about 10,000 additional jobs, 10,700 additional jobs. We chose to hold the jobs to population ratio constant. So it's the same in the future as it is today. That's another thing we may decide to test different, uh, looking at what the effects of encouraging more job growth in the region might, might do. Um, but for now, we're assuming that those are held constant. And we're assuming that the occupancy rate for housing stays the same in the future. Um, Flagstaff being a very uh, tourism and vacation oriented place, you have a relatively high vacancy rate in your housing stock because of a, all of the second homes that you have in your region. So we assume that that would keep, keep going, kind of looking similar as it does uh, today in the future. And finally, I mentioned this in the lead in, but um, we were very, very uh, cognizant of local zoning entitlements. And so we did a bunch of research on all of the county and city zoning that exists within the study area. And we, um, we, we designed our scenarios not to exceed those entitlements. And we also looked at development trends, where, where is a lot of the development happening both geographically and in which zones are we seeing the most development? And just just uh, just to show that we you know we're looking at that not just uh, aspatially but also in specific geographies in, in, in Flagstaff and region wide we have all that data from the city and county, and we used a tool called Urban Footprint to do this work, and uh, it is a scenario planning tool that's been in use for over a decade. It's been used all over the country. And we calibrated it and designed what we call place types, which are the things that we actually uh, paint onto the map to represent growth. We designed those place types using your, your county and city zoning. So we wanted to make sure that, that what we were showing as growth was actually reasonable and achievable given your current entitlements. So um, all that is to say, super preliminary so far. Um, we don't have results to share with you today. There's, it's still being reviewed. Um, by the city and county. Uh, but when, when it comes time to uh, meet with the public uh, at the end of next month, uh, we're certainly going to be sharing out some of the preliminary findings from the business as usual scenario, because like I said, it gives them something to react to, to say, I want to do better, or I want something different than what we're seeing under this scenario. So um, that is something that we will certainly be looping you all into as we find more out about what this scenario is doing for the region. Um, so next, we are going to go into a summary of what we heard from you all, this group, in our last TAG meeting, and how we used what we heard from you to move, move forward the discussion 
and, and focus a little bit more on what we think are the critical uncertainties that we need to be paying attention to for this region. So as a reminder, <clears throat> we, we were using a, a tool called Miro, um, and we were, we were in there and, and moving around our post-it notes and trying to organize our thoughts so that we could identify the critical uncertainties for the region. So the things that we think are going to be really impactful for what, what we're trying to achieve and, and are gonna affect, the, affect how the region grows, but that we're really not certain about that are kind of like out there possibilities. And then another set of things that we call critical certainties, which are those things that we know are gonna be really important for the region and impact how it grows. And that we're pretty sure are gonna be something we're gonna have to deal with in the future. So we looked at the four groups that we had and, and the um, post-it notes that they, that they moved around and, and allocated to those different areas of our little matrix that we see here. And, uh, and we, we put that into a, a database. So we have all of the, the post-it notes, the groups that contributed them, how many times similar themes were coming up in similar areas of the matrix. Uh, and we used this to create two sets of categories that, that kind of uh, melded all of the various feedback we got into something that we could actually uh, run some calculations on. So we had two classifications of comments, one that was pretty high level. So we organized the post-it notes under broad themes like climate change, transportation, housing, and then one that was a little bit more specific around the drivers of change that we had been discussing. Alex, and, if you click, you can kind of, it'll, there should be a little animation that shows those oh, thank you. classes. Perfect. Oh, that's beautiful. Look at that. Yeah. No, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good job, Io. Thank you for that. So um, two classes here, uh, reclass one, that's the more detailed one, and reclass two, that's the more high level one. Um, and then uh, we use those categories to find some agreement um, between groups. We wanted to understand where were people feeling like there was agreement around critical certainties and critical uncertainties? So for an example here, these are, are different drivers of change, right? But they're all organized under one broad theme, housing market. And then here are some others that are, are in another category here, fiscal health and transportation. So what did we find? Um, so in terms of high level categories, it seemed like members of the tag, you all, generally agreed that housing, climate change, and the economy were really, really critical for the region to plan for. Um, but there was, there was much more consensus around the things that we thought were certain. So things like housing, climate change, and the economy. You can see that in those red bars on the graph, they're much taller than the blue bars. So it seems as though we were, we were all in agreement about what we thought we knew. But if you look at the blue bars, they're much more spread out. And so there was much less agreement on what we were unsure about, which is not all that surprising, right? We know what we know, but opinions differ about what we don't. Um, so we thought that was a, a very interesting uh, finding there. And we can dig more into that to see what was actually contained within these, these largest categories. In terms of housing, if you look at the more detailed categorization within housing, you see a, a similar agreement and less agreement theme pop up here. So everyone seemed to be, or most people seem to be in agreement that um, housing costs would rise, but there was less certainty about external factors that might exacerbate that condition. So there's, if you think about, there's one bucket of general just national housing issues that are affecting Flagstaff. But then there are two other issues, one related to growth fueled by working from home and tourism, and one uh, that's related to how we use land. So whether we choose to grow in a more infill focused way or whether people are gonna prefer larger homes on larger lots, and then whether there's going to be increased population growth and competition for scarce housing resources, particularly in this region because of how attractive it is for people to work from home and also it's, it's tourism related uh, draw. And then on the climate side, you see a similar agreement about certainties and disagreement about uncertainties theme arise. So 
So people seemed pretty certain. In fact, there was no one who put frequent fires and floods in the uncertainty part of their matrix. But people were pretty certain that frequent fires and floods would be something that the region was going to have to deal with. So that was very interesting to see, not particularly surprising given the conversations that we heard. And then there were some other uh, areas where people still were placing a lot of uncertainty around, um, but that there was a little bit more of a split across the four groups. So uh, climate inaction was one. Um, the comments around this were, were sort of uh, focused on um, national and state level inaction on climate and that exacerbating climate change. So nationally, we don't put policy in this, into place that reduce driving or change how industries are regulated and that makes climate change worse locally. Um, climate migration was another one that several groups talked about. Um, this idea that, in, especially in other parts of the Southwest that are hotter, uh, like Phoenix, um, those places are going to become less desirable to live in because of the increased heat. And that's going to accelerate potentially population growth um, in places like Flagstaff that have a little bit more of a moderate summer temperature. Um, and then water woes was an interesting one. And people were split across whether water woes were something that um, was going to be exacerbated by climate change. So um, climate change would push us beyond the planning that we have done as a region for water to a place where we don't have enough. But then there were another group of people who said, no, that's not really a concern. It's more about the cost of providing water infrastructure that's going to be an issue for the region. But, but generally, if you group those together, lots of people saying that those are potentially very important issues for the region, but also quite uncertain. So how do all of these things touch down later in the project? Uh, well, we've, we've talked about things that were in those red bars that were in those charts. Those are the things that people tended to agree were critical certainties. And because we are all in agreement, we seem to generally agree that these are things that are going to be important for the regional plan to consider and that are reasonably um, certain to expect for, for the region in the future. These are going to be things that, that we're going to make sure each alternative scenario that's created is thinking about um, because they are basically a given for the future. So things like frequent fires and floods that we should we shouldn't waste our time with a scenario that ignores that, that future. Um, on the critical uncertainty side, there's a little bit more variation. Where we'd, we'd like to end up and where our conversation today will hopefully head is uh, that we identify a handful of critical uncertainties, about four ideally, that different scenarios will take different approaches to try to address. Some scenarios might do better at addressing them than others. Um, some scenarios may be surprising in the way that they are successful or unsuccessful at addressing certain critical uncertainties. Um, and, and so those will be measured uh, independently across each scenario. And not every scenario is likely to be um, designed to address all of them. So um, we are coming here to the, the end of our first discussion on, or the first report out on the tag. And I, I wanna invite folks to have a little discussion here. I know we, this has been uh, information dense as usual, but I wanna, I wanna end this portion of our meeting with this to offer you. And this is our, what we are assuming as the, the draft critical certainties. So again, this, this red bar, the thing that we want all scenarios to pay attention to, we're calling it the critical certainty baseline. And that is that in the future, we think the following are both very likely to occur and very important for the regional plan to consider. One, demand for housing will continue to increase driven by national trends and remote work. Two, Climate change has and will continue to cause more frequent fires and floods. Three, while water will become more expensive, supply is not likely to be a constraint to most development. And four, funding for capacity increasing roadway projects will still exist, but to a lesser degree than in the past. So this is all based on the things that we heard from you all um, and, and what we saw people push into that 
lower bottom right corner of all their matrix matrix matrices, um, the things that we, we thought were pretty certain and important. So I want to open it up um, to, the, to the group. And we can get more into this in the second half of the, the meeting. But let's spend about five minutes, maybe seven minutes, reflecting on this. Do people think that this makes sense to them? Do they feel confident in what we're saying here? Or are there things that we have missed or things that you'd, you'd like us to, to remove from what we're seeing here? And uh, I know it's, it can be hard to, to um, start to jump in and be the first, but please, please do unmute yourself or throw something in the chat. And I'm, I will call on people if it comes to that. So. Well, oh. there, uh, this is Ben Ruddle. Um There's, I, I agree with those four baselines that were just mentioned, but I think that there's a couple of others that are, um, that are, highly certain that we should be including as well. Um, I think that the aging trend um, topic that came up in discussion at the last meeting belongs on the baseline list because it is highly certain um, and it will change the, the character of the community in, in important ways, um, particularly from a planning point of view. So that, that should be on there. And the um, I think we kind of got it with the uh, with the roadway funding topic. Like transportation is on the list, but I'm not sure that 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 road funding is the um, is the right way to put it. I think maybe we could we could do better in terms of framing what we know to be true about future transportation. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that, Ben. Um, do others have any thoughts or reactions to, to what has just been put forward? Um, thoughts about transportation specifically um, and the, the aging population question? I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll provide you a bit of a, um, a look to, to the next section and say that um, the aging population question, I believe, is one that we have marked as a critical uncertainty right now. So that would be a, a change in that, in that regard. But um, any, any thoughts on, on what, what we've, uh, what's, what's been put out so far? I'm going to, I'm going to echo Ben's thought um, uh, as I'm, I'm two years away from 40. So uh, I do know that we get older <laughs> every day. Right. And I think that, you know, I mean, demographic change is kind of all these kind of one of the things that you can easily stick a pin in and say, this is, you know, this is going to happen. Right. All these people aren't going to die next week. They're going to be this bubble older at some point. Um, the, uh, you know, I don't know how interesting it is for us. I think that's kind of the other point, right? Like how relevant it is for our community. Um, but, you know, that's your guys job. Um, the, uh, the on the funding capacity one. When I look at a 10 year time frame, I also think about our political environment. Um, we've got another four years of a democratic governor who, you know, whether we like the way the system works or not, will focus more on um, the people who voted for her, uh, that part being flag stuff. So, you know, I think, you know, I, I mean, I'm definitely in my business planning for um, it being easier to get a dot money in democratic counties than it was, you know, a year ago when, you know, the Valley got everything. Um, but then again, time frame, right? That's a four year thing. Uh, inshallah, it'll be an eight year thing. Um, but, you know, we'll, uh, we'll wait and see. I think in our in our critical uncertainties discussion, you'll see that we uh, we have um, combined aging population and a shrinking population, and so perhaps there's an element there that we can break apart. Um, Sarah, well, I saw that you unmuted yourself. Go ahead. Yeah, one thing that someone brought to me about this topic of aging population that's not part of the conversation so far is that we actually have a dichotomy 
in the region, which is that Flagstaff's population may be aging, but the the population on the Navajo Nation, some of the surrounding uh, tribal nations, is actually younger. And the average, like the 50% of the population on the Navajo Nation, I was told, and I need to do some verification, but I can't because census data is not all out yet, um, is under 25, supposedly. So I think there is the possibility that while Flagstaff may be aging, it may be that our workforce starts coming from surrounding areas not just because of affordability, just be, but also because this demographic shift is occurring in two different ways within a two hour radius of a city. Um, and so I wanna put that in there as a complexity to just simply saying we are aging and our services need to shift um, because I think there's more than one dynamic at play there. Is, uh, that's really interesting, Sarah. I wonder if, is Dorothy on the call, Dorothy Gishy? No, unfortunately, she she emailed me and wasn't able to make it today. But that might be something we have to dive in a little more with her and Rose and some other people who really are experts in that relationship between our community and our tribal nation neighbors, um, because that could be really um, a dynamic that changes how we talk about carbon neutrality, that changes how we talk about a lot of things. Um, and so I want to I want to have that in front of us so that we don't oversimplify that one item. Okay. I haven't had enough time to dive into details, but I will ask for more information on it too. Any other initial thoughts about this? Um, this is Pat McGurvey, and I, I guess, you know, in the group I was in, we didn't talk a lot about um, the more frequent wildfire and floods. And I, I just want to make sure, you know, sometimes that statement right there that, you know, even though you know, the majority of our wildfires historically have been from lightning and in, in northern Arizona, that lightning has decreased over the years. So we're actually not seeing more frequent fires. We might be seeing more frequent um, catastrophic fires or uncharacteristic wildfires. So I just want to make sure like we're not linking frequency to just the, the number, I guess, on there. That's a really great point, Pat. So maybe severity is a better yeah. way to frame it. Sure. And then, um, you know, as we're all feeling with the flood piece of that, I kind of was thinking about that conversation about the water that we've had. And, um, you know, if we had investments in infrastructure, would, would we have the floods that have the impact, I guess? So, so to me, I, I think that statement, there's a lot of uncertainty there, and this group made that feel very, very certain, and I'm not sure I feel real certain about that. So maybe on the flood side, if we disconnect it from how, how well adapted we are to dealing with them, um, major, we could almost call it like a, like a major post-fire post rain event, I don't know. Um, but I think that the, the, the water... Yeah issues are seemed from what the discussions I heard and, and review of, of other discussions seem to coalesce around being more severe and in combination with those more severe fires, more severe flooding could occur. It's all a question of how the scenarios, the policies and investments that they put into place, how they handle that. Right. right. So I think we, we will be able to explore that and we won't assume that uh, floods are are just something we have to live with in each scenario, certainly. Can I jump in on, on half point two? I think there's, you know, because it's the, <clears throat> my other role, right, is a, I'm a real estate developer on one side, but I also run a, a company that's working on, you know, ways to monetize um, the, uh, the product coming out of thinning projects on the National Forest, right? So we've had a massive reinvestment in that recently um and i think you know and I'd, I'd, I'd love to know whether bachelor agrees or not right but the, it, the I, I think there is still a debate as to whether that is something that's caused by climate change or whether it's caused by forest management and 
probably given as a debate, it's probably caused by both, right? Um, both, you know, concepts are, are relevant. So, um, you know, climate change is impacting the health of our forests, um, but also, you know, we we kind of effectively stopped managing um, our forests um, locally, at least, right? Um, when we, um, you know, shut down commercial logging um, due to, you know, environmental concerns. And so I think that has that definitely shifted, you know, um, in, in, you know, in a certain direction at this point. Um, and we're kind of, you know, we, we are being more holistic about how we manage the forest, right, and how we do it for both the benefit of, you know, our endangered species and for the benefit of the people who live right next door and whose houses might burn down. Um, and so, you know, I, it just, it, it feels like that word could, could change, but it also feels like it might be too complicated of an issue to try and solve in, in this project. Thanks for that, David. Um, I and if, oh, go ahead. If I can just jump in. Thanks, Alex. And, and thanks, David. I think it's, it's complicated. There's so many factors when we think about the forest. So I appreciate both your thoughts as well as Pat's. One thing I will say, um, you know, the infamous Prius, flooding video right from last year that actually wasn't in the burn scar right that was over on steve's that was simply from high severity rains right that we're seeing more and more and so and had nothing to do with a burn scar and so i think that we can you know it, it's both and i think and 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 obviously a lot of complexity on the forest side and i agree that in some ways it's a management question um but i i think it's, it's actually both just because we know climate change there's more energy in the atmosphere we see more intensity of basically all types of weather and while I'm talking, if I if I can, just on transportation, um, just because I have to jump off, I, I do really appreciate Ben's thoughts about how we frame that, right? Is it roadway projects, which I think we all think of expansion, right, as opposed to sort of transportation projects? Um, you know, I also think like this community needs to have a, a real conversation about kind of our capacity, right, for funding going forward, right? Um, you know, we have some really big, big transportation infrastructure projects on the books right now, um, and if anybody's been paying attention to the stormwater conversation, have really struggled to raise our stormwater rates, right, to, to deal with our, our increasing stormwater needs. Um, and I think that goes to capacity of our taxpayers, right? And so I actually feel like funding for transportation is is more uncertain, right, as our climate risks increase, right, as our stormwater, you know, if you look at our post-fire post needs, right, and what they are after last year, what does that look like for the next couple of big fires, right? And so um, I don't like to fear monger, but I do think this community really has to have a conversation about tax capacity and the ability to do certain things, which I think will definitely have impacts on our transportation funding. Thanks for that. And and I, I think, uh, Jenny, when we get into the critical uncertainties discussion, some of that's gonna be reflected there. Um, so I wanna make sure we have enough time to, to get into this conversation and. Um, there's a number of, of, of folks on the call whose expertise I think is going to be super helpful for that discussion. Um, so I want to make sure we get there. Um, Ayano, can you remind me when were we going to take our break? Yeah, we have our break between the two discussions. So okay, yeah. so no rest for the wicked then. On to the next piece. So um, we want to. So we we can still refine the uh, the critical uh, certainties piece. And as a reminder, that's something that's going to be presented ideally to the public at the end of March, um, along with these critical uncertainties. But we want to feel really solid that um, we are presenting the critical certainties as the given that they are going to have to all work with when they're working through their their game exercises. Um, but these uncertainties are something that they're going to be interacting with in a different way. And so we looked at all the feedback that we received from you all, and we uh, we came up with seven critical uncertainties for the region. And we'd like your help getting those refined, ideally to four, um, to make it more manageable for the public when we we go to them. So I'll uh, I'll walk you through those seven two at a time. Um, starting with these. So the first one, and you can see on the slide, we have a, a short explainer of what each of the uh, critical uncertainties is. And we've given them a, a working title that we can certainly change. 
And below you can see the post-it note categories that we think are associated with, with these. And these are ones that we got a good amount of um, movement on during the exercise. So the first one we're currently calling Mountain Town Exclusivity. Um, so this, the idea here is that driven by remote work, tourism, and other factors, Flagstaff becomes an exclusive mountain town like Bozeman, Aspen, Bend, or Jackson, um, even to a greater degree than some might argue it already is. Um, and we think the related drivers of change here are the housing cost conundrum, tourism drivers, pandemics to some degree, as we've seen those accelerate work from home, transportation technology adoption. So things like autonomous vehicles maybe could be something that accelerates this. Uh, the Zoom town discussion we had obviously is related. And then growing out, as we've seen in a lot of these places, um, as, as folks with who are more mobile um, ec economically, they have greater wealth, they prefer larger homes on larger lots, often that's going to be um, further outside of, of the, the core of the region. And I'll go through all seven of these and then we can have a, a time to, to go back and discuss, so bear with me. Um, the next one, uh, speaking kind of the, some of the things Jenny was saying, infrastructure funding challenges. So here we think a critical uncertainty of the region may be that the cost to maintain infrastructure keeps going up and revenues cannot keep pace with that. And as a result, um, we end up with crumbling infrastructure. Um, and we think the uh, related drivers of change could be something at the national or state level that creates issues for funding for large transportation projects, like the freeway funding fiasco. Um, potentially water woes, the side of that issue that deals with delivery of water, uh, the infrastructure for water, rather than uh, um, the, uh, the, the actual supply of it in the region. Climate migration, you know, if we get a big influx of people moving here very quickly, it's much more difficult to keep up with infrastructure. Um, and then the fiscal budget fiasco, which is directly related to not having enough revenue to cover um, capital projects and maintenance. Uh, the next two here, climate-driven migration. So here the idea is that uh, in the future, impacts of climate change are felt more severely in other parts of the Southwest and of, of the US, and people seek out places that have cooler summers like Flagstaff. So that accelerates the housing market, um, creates a bunch of other issues that, that we can talk about. Um, the next one is declining higher ed enrollment. Uh, Northern Arizona University enrollment declines or goes virtual to a greater degree than today, and what that would mean for the local economy, um, for the, the balance of jobs and housing in the region, um, also impacting things like even um, whether we, we can pay for infrastructure. Uh, number five and six, inaction on climate action is one. So this, this one deals with uh, local, state, and federal inaction causes more climate change to be even, impacts to be more severe than we already expect they will be in our baseline. Um, and that impacts all kinds of, uh, of other drivers of change, um, like the economy, uh, the amount of snow that's up in the mountains, uh, food resiliency, the amount of water that we have available to us, um, and then uh, uh, generally, uh, locally how, how those are, effects are felt. And then uh, water supply issues. So this is, this is more to the side of the water woes issue that's about having the water locally, not just building the infrastructure to deliver it. And here, uh, climate change would be more severe than expected and uh, we would not have enough water and that would limit growth both on the residential and the commercial side. And finally, an aging slash shrinking population, which maybe we could change to focus more on the shrinking population side. Um, but we think they're related. Um, the state certainly does. They think that um, births are not going to keep pace with deaths in the region and that over time, the aging population will cause a decline overall in, in population. Um, and so this could have all kinds of impacts on uh, the mix of jobs in the region, also paying for infrastructure um, if there's less growth. Um, so lots of considerations there. Um, so I will pause there and show you all seven. 
And I'm happy to go back to any that others would like to discuss. And in about 10 minutes or so, 10, 15 minutes, I'd like to um, actually go, go through a, a poll to see what folks are thinking, or maybe, maybe in five minutes or so. But first, let's have a kind of question and answer period just generally. Anything anyone wants to mention about any of the seven that we've presented? So, Alex, um, yeah, let's let's give us a little more time to process this. But I think just to keep with our um, momentum of the meeting, I'd suggest we pull now, and then we can use that to kind of seed our conversation. Okay, sure, that works for me. Yeah, um, maybe it'll be easier for folks to just respond on their own, and then we can dive in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Let's do that. I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll, which basically lists the seven critical uncertainties that Alex just went through. And what we just want to ask as just a function to help kind of keep the conversation moving, it's not a decision making poll, is just to ask you all uh, which among these seven, which four critical uncertainties seem most important to consider. So I'm going to launch that right now. So that should be popping up somewhere on your end. And uh, the poll has been configured so that you can click multiple options. Um, it looks like, okay, people are starting to weigh in now. Excellent. Um, so can I ask a clarifying question? Is this, these are, these are already determined, these are uncertainties. They're not. So we've decided there are uncertainties and which of the four are we, do we think are the most important? Is that correct? Yeah, so that's correct. For the it's it's for discussion purposes. So we summarized um, based on you know the feedback we heard from the last tag meeting. We've kind of rolled up these uh, critical uncertainties based on what we heard as most important, and and kind of characterized them in these seven different ways. And so this poll is just kind of saying, all right, like assuming you generally. Uh, which one, which four kind of track with you? And maybe it's maybe it's just more about which one do you want to discuss the most is really what the question is asking. So we're not we're not making choosing four for a final decision today. It's more for discussion purposes. Um, looks like we have uh, about sixty percent. All right, we're trickling in. I'm going to give this uh, fifteen more seconds for people to um, weigh in with their response. And then based on that, we'll, I'll turn around the um, poll so we can all kind of look at what bubbled to the top. Um, I also want to address Julie's comment earlier about the challenge with the critical certainty list is that it uh, seems like it's only attributing kind of one or two items and that suggesting perhaps that we consider a range of outcomes for each certainty. And I think that if I'm understanding that that point, um, Julie, is that that's that's kind of what the critical uncertainty um, aspect of the scenario planning process is going to be more about, um, and that we want to have um, you know a fixed number of variables when we're creating um, our scenarios, and um, so the the certainties are kind of what that baseline set of variables are and then the uncertainty is where we can kind of be more uh right. well explore kind of how, how that might play out um but but if i misunderstood that please feel free as we get into the conversation here to jump in more all right i'm going to end the poll in three two one um and i'll share the results here so um, I'll summarize. I, I think I saw some people trying to jump in the conversation and I'll let you in a moment. Um, so we have a bit of a spread here, but um, as you can see, kind of top uncertainties that are rising here are climate change, migration, infrastructure, funding challenges, and it seems like mountain town exclusivity. So um, Tyler, was that you who you wanted to jump in for a moment? Yeah, I actually had a, I wanted a clarifying question on infrastructure funding challenges. Uh, what exactly does that mean? Because if it's things like transportation infrastructure, 
uh, the cost of that already exceeds our revenues. User fees for roads like registration fees and gas taxes are already like less than half what's spent on roadway expansion and maintenance. Uh, the difference is made up by rating the general fund. Um, so is it just saying that we're going to stop accepting that scenario, that, that situation where general fund pays for infrastructure? Uh, yeah, what does that mean exactly? It's a good, it's a good comment. Um, so I, maybe what we, what we're trying to uh, capture with that one is that the cycle of kind of passing, passing the buck down year after year eventually hits a dead end and that we actually start to see more than we do today, a, a degrading of the quality of infrastructure. Um, and, and that it just continues to get worse, um, that we don't find some, some stopgap or, or way to, to bridge what we're already not able to, uh, the, the funding we're already not able to generate. But I mean, the, the, the shorter answer, I think, is that we can, we have time today to get down to more detail on these things. Um, so would appreciate your feedback, maybe when we, if we can agree that this is something we want to look at further, um, a little bit later in the meeting, we can, we can talk more specifically about what, what we mean by infrastructure funding challenges. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. So, um, yeah, as Ayana was, was summarizing, I think it's interesting um, to see these three that are, are currently coming up as, as uh, our top three, Mountain Town Exclusivity, Climate Driven Migration, and Infrastructure Funding Challenges. I want to take a second here and just, just highlight maybe the ones that weren't quite as popular. Um, declining higher ed enrollment was sort of at the back of the pack. Anyone want to say anything about why maybe they didn't want to choose that one to talk about more? I'll jump in on that one because one of the one of the projects I did back um, when I was a management consultant was for the University of California, right at the office of the president. And one of their major challenges, you know, was adding another UC campus. They ended up adding UC Merced. Um, but it just became harder and harder and harder to actually put, you know, just based on societal and economic issues, right, to put a new campus anywhere. Um, so you had, you know, the, the, realistically what they were looking at is, okay, if you've got a growing population, you just have to stuff your new students into your existing campuses. You know, you're not going to get another one. You know, I mean, are we going to get something, you know, are we going to get a new ASU in Yuma? You know, I don't, I just don't see it happening. So that's kind of why I, I wrote, didn't vote for that one. What about uh, some of the NAU folks that we have, Stephanie or Mikhail? Any, any thoughts to add? I mean, you, if I remember correctly from our first meeting, you were both pretty, you were, you were pretty certain that this was not going to be a major issue for for you and it's not really entered into much of your long range planning. So if you could maybe just quickly give us your your take on the matter. Yeah, I'm I'm happy to to say that I mean this is certainly something that NAU considers <laughs> constantly. It's part of our campus master plan and we're um and not to say that we're looking at declining enrollment but shifting enrollment um between undergrad, graduate, online, distance sites, that sort of thing. I, I didn't vote for this in terms of this project because I don't think it's as critical to the Flagstaff um, regional plan as it is to NAU's plans. Um, and I know NAU is obviously a big source of population temporarily each year, um, which we do have a big economic impact into the city, but I don't see us having dramatic enrollment swings either. So um, that's my two cents. I don't know if anyone else from NAU wants to speak up. But... Uh, this yeah, is Ben, just... I agree. Oh, I mean, I, I was a department chair. I got to see that side of things. And I mean, there's, there's certainly lots of things that happen at NAU, lots of changes, but 
from Flagstaff point of view, they're going to be relatively small. They're not, it's, it's not like NAU is going to disappear or triple in size. It's not going to happen. And Great. this is Thank Mikkel, you. and and I'm in academic affairs at the university, and I I would concur. I think we're going to be coming up with different solution sets. Uh, you know, we might see a decline in actual on campus number of students, but I don't feel like it's going to happen necessarily in this time frame. Uh, and we're looking at other avenues for how to you know offer services and stuff. So I don't feel like our staffing per se is going to shift in this time frame. Okay, thanks for that. I, I think that's that's com that's helpful to know, and and I think we can. You know, I'm glad we have this so well covered in this group. Um, what about the water supply issues? I'll, I'll just say that in the meet in the last meeting and reviewing everyone's comments, um, there was a there was definitely a thread that um, people are are worried about water supply, but it's the the concern is maybe overstated for the region because um, you do a good job of, of planning. Um, your your capacity uh, for water. Um, so maybe I, I don't know who exactly on the call might be the best person to respond to something like this, but for those who are in the know, have has anyone considered a population growth or a climate change informed scenario where you don't just you don't full stop have enough water to accommodate what's happening in the region? Uh, this is Ben. I, let me take that one since I'm I'm on the Water Commission and I have a PhD on this topic. Um, my view on this is that there there is no uh, possible future where Flagstaff itself or the Greater Flagstaff region um, has any water limited growth. There are there are many reasons for that, um, and I could I could get into the details if anybody is curious. But um, the the issue is is not water. We have far more water uh, in the region than we need. Mostly, that's due to a lack of competition for it. We just don't have. Um, you know, F F Flagstaff has a has more or less a monopoly on the water supply coming off the peaks and and in this forest region and it's a very large water supply um and so and, and there just there just aren't large competing uses that are going to come in um it's not possible um there won't be agriculture or anything happening here um the the issue is funding i mean water water is um is not a limiting factor if you have money uh, enough to pay for it mm -hmm. um, so th that's the concern and there's a there's a blurring there between that and the infrastructure funding challenges theme or critical uncertainty that we've come up with and i, I do think that that's going to be one we want to dig into more to decide what piece of that we want people to focus on um, when they are creating their own scenarios for flagstaff whether it's uh, the cost of water supply um, for providing the mains and, and all of that, or whether it's the actual cost of water itself to the end user, or whether we want to focus on, on more transportation uh, focused stuff. Um, so, okay, Alex, this so, is Michelle James. Yeah, please. Alex, uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm agreeing with what uh, Ben said in terms of it's related to infrastructure. For instance, if we have to go with Red Gap Branch, I'll get into some specifics. Sustainable Cities gonna... Network and Project Cities program. I want to welcome you to our... Hello? I think maybe we had some, some background can I keep, can I keep noise. Speaking? Yeah, yeah, please, okay. please continue. Um, so Red Gap Branch is going to cost a lot of money. And so the link to infrastructure is really, really important. And um, that seems like we could cover the water supply issues under the topic of infrastructure funding challenges, because it is going to cost a lot to do. And then I'm also thinking about, in terms of water, I'm thinking about um, a comment made by someone on the city staff that we may have a lot of water, but other places in Arizona probably won't in the future. And they may be asking to get some of our water. And I think that is a, a particular uncertainty. Um, so I, I think water supply issues need to be included somewhere in these four that we end up deciding upon. Thanks. 
that's really interesting and, and an angle we hadn't considered. Um, okay, so I think for now we can we can probably deprioritize the bottom two there, declining higher ed enrollment and water supply issues. Um, that leaves us with five. And um, between the, the three that we're scoring more highly, um, there are two that remain the aging slash shrinking population aspect of things and then the inaction on climate uh, aspect of things. I think what I'd recommend is that we go through and we just have a chat about those five. And then, Ayana, would it be possible to run the poll again uh, afterwards and see where we sure. land? Sure. And I just as a time check, we um, you know, have a break coming up, uh, at least scheduled for 1210 Mountain Time, uh, so in about three minutes, uh, before we then uh, revisit or get into our um, performance metrics conversation. So I want to just be mindful of that, but I, I think we can, we can steal a little more time for this um, Great. piece of it. Um, but why don't we do our break now, maybe five minutes and come back at, or maybe we can call it uh, 12.15. Yeah, let's, let's do 12.15 and then re return to wrap this conversation up and then move on to our last piece. Okay. Great. Um, well, thanks everyone. We'll we'll be back. We'll see you back here at twelve fifteen. So, welcome back, everybody. So, a uh, quick update on um, where we are with our, our our agenda and schedule for today. Um, we are. I would not say exactly behind schedule, but I think we want to shift where we focus for today. So um, we're going to spend the next 15 minutes until 1230 digging into these five. And I've highlighted the two in red that were not um, bubbling to the top. And then um, we'll do another poll at 1230. And then we'll spend about 15, 20 minutes talking about how we measure uh, how scenarios perform relative to these things. And then we'll finish up with a uh, looking ahead to the public engagement that's um, scheduled for the end of March. So uh, hopefully you all are back. And uh, I want to get into these uh, one by one, um, starting with this idea of mountain town exclusivity. So this was this was polling in the high 80s. So, uh, you know, four out of five of you thought that this was one that we should probably look at further. So i um, curious to just thinking about this more expansively, um, what would this mean for, for instance, uh, the housing market in Flagstaff if, if Flagstaff did become uh, if, uh, more of a, a, a high-end high exclusive mountain town? Um, anyone want to weigh in on that? So is... This scenario assuming that we continue to have a limited housing supply relative to demand, because in my mind, exclusivity is a feature of having a limited housing supply to demand, which means that only the wealthiest uses predominate here. Only the wealthiest residents are able to stay here. Um, I mean, if housing supply is able to grow, I suppose you can have, you know, your wealthy visitors alongside working class people and it works out just fine. Yeah, and that's exactly that's exactly what we want to open ourselves up to considering. Um, it doesn't the name is probably problematic for that reason, but we don't want to assume necessarily that housing prices go out of control if something like this were to happen. But what we want to focus on here is that um, something that we can't control, just the attractiveness of this place, causes it to become as desirable as places like Aspen or Jackson. Um, but in the scenarios that we explore, we can try different um, policies or investments that try to create what you just said, uh, allowing the people who live here now and people who aren't as economically mobile to coexist alongside uh, wealthier, more economically mobile folks. Does that make sense? I see Sarah's hand. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> so 
uh, one thing I would say, Tyler, is um, I know we haven't gotten to where we're ready to share results of the business as usual scenario. Um, but, you know, when I look at the, the zoning code um, snapshot that we have online, 50% of all the land in our Flagstaff region that's developable is zoned R1, so for large lot single family homes. And I think that is one of the features that would create exclusivity if nothing changes. And there's a lot of disincentives um, because it's difficult to rezone and upzone properties. There's always opposition um, to seeing that be changed unless there's a more radical or a more um, aggressive policy um, from the city or county to move things in a different direction. We offer incentives, we start really pushing things. So I don't know how different this one will be from the status quo maybe until we push things along. But I think that that's, um, this is a direction we may be on the path for. This like might be the path of least resistance, I guess, when I look at the uncertainties we're talking about is heading towards this one. Can I, can I echo Sarah's point? Because, um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I will do that, <laughs> right? I mean, I am the real estate developer who looks at the, you know, at the zoning and says, and I've heard it from pretty much every other developer in town too, that, um, you know, if, if we can't, if it's too hard to build higher density, which generally services people at a lower income level, um, then, you know, our, our, if we're about to lose our, our investor because they just say, look, this isn't worth it anymore, you end up building luxury homes for, you know, for for people who are generally, you know, rich or from out of town. Um, and it's like, it, it's 100% what I do not want to do. Um, but, you know, I, I don't, I control 10% of the money in my projects, and you know, not the rest of it. So um, someone else can, you know, make that decision for me um so in that sense i know it's kind of like is it is it really um is it really uncertain or not i think there was another point i i thought about during the break but kind of from an equity standpoint right that if you look at um you know it's not just people with lower incomes who are not as economically mobile like alex said um it is also the the, the as people get older um they dislike uncertainty more. And if climate change is gonna drive a more uncertain weather future, then it strikes me that the uncertainty of, we have over the next 10 years of whether people want to move, you know, who are retiring, that we know they're retiring, there's a, you know, there's a big baby boom retirement bump. Like, are they gonna be able to, are they gonna look at flag stuff and say that's, an attractive destination, or they're going to say, you know, I want somewhere with more consistent weather, basically. And that's really the that's really the question: um, is does this does this uh, result in greater population growth? Does it result in a stronger preference for larger, more expensive housing types? Um, and related to that, how does it? How do we think it would affect? the um the ability to provide services do we think that it would put the region in a better position to be able to keep its infrastructure uh in a state of good repair or not i mean for sure i mean second wealthy second homeowners use infrastructure less and pay more property taxes what about on the on on our ability to keep uh keep housing options open for existing residents or the workforce, folks who are likely to be priced out. Um, are there folks here who work in the affordable housing space who could speak to uh, how that, how increased population growth, increased competition for housing could impact the region's ability to build subsidized affordable housing? Do we have anyone who could help with that? Maybe Devana? She's on the call or- I don't believe Devana is on the call today. 
Oh, well, while you're waiting, let me throw in an, just another confirming comment. This is not a disagreement. It's a confirmation um, of this being present course and speed. I mean, I'm what while we're I live in Country Club and I'm under the flight path while we've had this conversation. No fewer than 10 private jets have flown over my house. <laughs> right. That's. We already are that community, and we are going to we are going to probably keep drifting that direction more and more in the future. Um, and I think that you, it, it, to see the future of a place like Flagstaff, you 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 just need to look at some of the other mountain towns uh, around the West that have been a decade or two ahead of us in in that process to see where we're going. So, so I saw, uh, thanks for that comment. And I, yeah, it, it makes sense. Um, I, th I think maybe a, a reframing focusing question, and then we probably need to move on is, do we believe that there is a trend here that is going to pull us away from what the state thinks population growth looks like in this region? Do we think that Flagstaff is going to grow more because of uh, because of this 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 trend or external this uncertainty? I do. I think the state's wrong. Anyone else feel that way? I I could I think there's I think it's more complicated. Um, you know, uh, the, the thing about a private jet, to Ben's point, right, you only need one billionaire. Um, that's one person, right? Um, and, um, but, you know, so how much of a difference is that going to make? Um, you know, I, the thing that concerns me, and it's, it's to, to Michelle's point, right, is it's that missing, you know, we get a missing middle, um, so we end up having highly subsidized, you know, the, the, there's an existing infrastructure for subsidizing affordable housing at the, you know, at the lower end of, of the income ladder, um, you know, the highest end of the income ladder, um, you know, <laughs> said if they've got a private jet, it doesn't matter, um, you know, what happens to the folks in the middle, um, you know, and yeah, do they all just move to, to Belmont or, or Winslow? Yeah, and that, that gets at some of the transportation questions um, of uh, where where do where does the workforce live, and are we creating longer commutes, more congestion, more um, more greenhouse gases if we're forcing folks to drive further? Um, lots to unpack here, but let's let's keep going here. Um, climate driven migration. So again, this one is uh, thinking about a, a critical uncertainty that causes people to choose to move or or sometimes not even have a choice to move out of places that are um, experiencing extreme heat. Do we buy the, the, the idea that someone would move to Flagstaff as a, a with, with a, as a non-discretionary choice? Like would they choose if they were if Phoenix was getting too many 110 degree days every summer, um, and it caused them to have health issues or impacted their work. Do we buy that that kind of a, a situation would push someone into Flagstaff? Or is Flagstaff too much more expensive? Um, and it would, would it be more of a discretionary move? I think, Alex, what, the, what your point raises is that it's not the discretionary migration. It, it's not the... it's. It, where is the discretionary migration right and because we're a tourist town with a lot of second homes i think that the climate driven migration is kind of going to be amplified right into that second home market um the people who don't have a choice will continue to not have a choice um, but the people who do um you know they'll keep their house in scottsdale where they're making tons of money but they'll just buy another one up, up here Yeah, I was going to add just thanks, David. I, I think the, the these last two are just so hand in hand, right? And I think that the climate issues down in the valley, right, which is our fit, nation's fifth largest city, right, which is going to be more and more unlivable during the summer, 
um, are really, really critical to the just so tied to each other and tied to that exclusivity and, and second home ownership, et cetera. Tyler, I see a raised hand. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to throw this out for thought. Like this absolutely makes sense to me that as we start to see more impacts from climate change, that's going to push more people up into Flagstaff. But it is interesting to me that I actually only ever see the reverse in my personal life. I know tons of people that moved down to Phoenix from Flagstaff because housing was expensive here and they couldn't get a good job. Um, but I don't know anyone that came up. I, I don't see any trend to the reverse at the moment. It's just interesting to me, uh, the dichotomy there between my personal and what sort of makes sense to me. Yeah, no, that, that's, I, I think that that makes some sense. Um, let me let me put this to the group. Um, so we heard that that the, there's this idea that these this and becoming a more um, or population growth and and growth in general uh, becoming a, a more desirable place to live um, is related to this climate driven migration. But am I correct in assuming that um, it's it's related because the folks who are being induced to move by climate change are doing so uh, into second homes because they are wealthier folks. Flagstaff is not one of those. Do we think that Flagstaff is not one of those places that's going to accept um, people who are displaced and are on the lower end of the income scale? Is it only going to be an acceptor for the higher income folks, most likely? And I would be curious to hear from folks who work more in those realms with <clears throat> communities who might not have the kind of mobility, uh, like Roxana and Kim, if you have some thoughts on this, what you are already seeing or have been seeing on this. Uh, we also will need to take our poll or move on to our topic shortly, but I want to make some time to hear from you both if you have some thoughts. This is Roxana. I can tell you that I know plenty of families <clears throat> that have lived in Flagstaff for generations that are moving out of Flagstaff. Um, you know, working class uh, for sure. And, you know, working in the tourist industry, uh, industry as well. Um, hotel, restaurant. People coming from Phoenix or from other parts of the state what I've seen is mostly more um, the NEU student population that is more and more common that are coming, you know, doing what they need to do and leaving Blackstaff as soon as they can because it is so expensive. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't, at least at this point, I agree that, you know, most lower income families are not gonna have a choice. They're gonna stick around in Phoenix. Blackstaff is not the first place you come to do that you can afford for sure. Thank you, Roxana. That's that's very helpful context. So I think the way we'd envision this one, it, hearing from you all of you now doesn't make quite as much sense to me anymore because the way this is talked about nationally is that folks who don't have a choice are gonna be pushed out of very hot or very fire or flood prone places. And Flagstaff is just not one of those places where they're likely to land. The type of migration is much more, uh, you know, is much more this type of migration that you're seeing. So I would say when we vote again in a few minutes, uh, consider that possibility that maybe this piece, the, the second one, the climate driven migration gets, gets pushed together and is part of the story um, for, for this one. Um, because I, I think as others have said, it is linked. Um, <clears throat> So I just want to I want to spend one more minute here on the aging shrinking population question because this is one of the ones that got a little bit of a lower vote but we've we've discussed around it a little bit. Um, I think the the question here it's it's very much the opposite of the one we were just talking about. Um, and I think Tyler earlier was, was suggesting that we frame a lot of these around population growth, and I think that's that's probably the story with a lot of them. Um, so here it would be that. that uh, this critical uncertainty that Flagstaff actually doesn't grow um, as much as as we think it might in the other critical uncertainty. Do we think that's worth considering in this scenarios process that that we're actually going to 
maybe even underperform what the state currently considers the, the middle forecast where we plateau in about 20 years? Yes. Thank you. I care to elaborate on that. Julie, was that the one thing you said this whole time? Yes. <laughs> Timing it so it's it's got maximum impact. Man, that was an important yes. But I, I'd like to know more. Does anyone know? Julie, do you have any additional comments on that? Well, I think just hearing the the dialogue and reading the chat about it um, and then looking at how the trends in development are currently shifting with applications in hand at the city. Um, we're not trending towards the population that I think we thought we would be trending towards um, when we worked on the area plan and the regional plan, excuse me, in 2010. Um, so in, I don't, in terms of yeah, uh, just, demographics or the amount of growth? the amount of growth and um, and just the availability of, um, or just, just, just both. Yeah, I guess both. Okay. And I would just jump in as a parent of teenagers. It's like, I already know my kids are probably not going to be able to live in Flagstaff. There's not going to be employment. There's not, you know, affordable housing. So, you know, they can love it and they come from a family that's been here for generations, um, you know, and we're both professionals, you know, speaking to Roxanna, it's like, I get it. There's, I don't see how anybody in the working class, you know, per se is going to be able to stay here. And now we're getting to the point where the kind of middle class can't afford it either. And definitely not new families and, you know, new generations. Unless we unless we do something about it, Mikkel. I mean, that's kind of my I'd say that. Agreed. But I'm saying, <laughs> Agreed. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, I'm also just looking at what my own house, you know, valuation has done in the last, you know, two years, and it's insane, right? And there's no way my kids can jump that gap unless we do have a lot of other things possible. Mm -hmm. I, I, Alex, I want to throw in another one here. There's just to think about, you know, I think the trend nation you know that, that we see across um uh, across all you know political economies is that the um you know as you get a more a wealthier more educated workforce um you know they they have more time free time right so recreation becomes a more important issue to them um and you know we have seen um you know we've seen to a certain extent that happen in flash stuff right we 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 the land that we do have, you know, available for development um, to put houses on is the the voting public, um, you know, when they're given the opportunity, will say no. Let's use that for recreation instead. Um, and that you know that happens, um, you know, you know that happens more and more. And if the community becomes wealthier and better educated, you know, on a demographic basis, then that's, you know, that trend is liable to continue. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think uh, we should keep this conversation or just be mindful of that we have about 20 minutes left and we want to keep about 10-ish minutes to talk about what's happening next with the project. Yeah, and I think the, the discussion about how we measure each scenario and 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 how we can measure it relative to these things, we can have that conversation in the next tag meeting. This is really the critical piece. Um, so I, if if uh, unless Sarah and and Melissa have um, big objections, I, I would say let's keep this, this discussion going for another uh, ten minutes or so, and then we can switch to that last piece. Sounds good. I'd like to add something to this discussion. So. Please, please. There is, there are things Flagstaff can do to pivot in a direction that counteracts this kind of uncertainty. The problem we have right now with the current regional plan is we didn't have a good sense of those trade-offs. And so we picked everything we wanted and we actually can't have everything we want. We're going to have to make some trade-offs. And so for instance, where I grew up, 
when I was 24 years old and was looking for my first job, couldn't find a job that paid me enough to live there. 10 years later, my younger sister is 24 years old. And not only did she find a job, but she's bought a house and it was a job that paid a good enough wage that she could buy a house as a single woman and build an ADU. And so I think that there, um, and that housing market had grown significantly since I was a, a kid in town. And so I do think there are ways that you can pivot within our time frame on trends like this, but you have to give some things up or make trade-offs to do that. And I think that's really what I want to keep in mind as we're talking about all of these uncertainties. They're not dead ends, but they're choices. And last time we made, we chose everything or sort of chose nothing. And what we're trying to do in this exploratory process is push towards actually making a choice and actually choosing a direction so that we can be effective against the uncertainties we feel we really care about the most and have the most. And that will give us a better chance of actually having an impact with all of these exterior trends. So places have done this, it's not impossible, but if we get into a loss aversion mindset where we don't wanna give up anything on any front, we won't get to the point where we can make movement on any of these things. We'll just maintain the status quo. So that's my two cents to keep the conversation going. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, I wanna make sure we, we talk about this one, the infrastructure funding challenges piece, because it's it's pretty the story's pretty broad and I, I'd love to get some input on um, what, what people think we should focus on with the public. Um, so we so far, just to recap, you know, we talked about how uh, Flagstaff's desirability maybe is the variable that's that we have no control over necessarily um, might fuel additional population growth. We've talked about um, how uh, maybe we have over maybe we're we're overstating the amount of growth and maybe. Uh, the aging population and other trends, uh, lower migration, in migration are going to result in lower population growth than we expect. Um, there's a couple things in, in what we've, we've selected uh, in the first poll that deal with uh, higher than expected climate impacts. But this one is more specifically um, focused on how much things cost and what we're able to maintain in terms of our infrastructure. Um, so that could be everything from water, which we've talked about a little bit, to parks, to uh, the state of our roads and which roads get get built and, and which don't, and which transit investments we make, bike and ped investments. So anyone have any really strong feelings about what this one should really focus on? I don't have strong feelings, but I want to share share a story if I may, because it was a. I think it just it it links the aging population in this one, right? I have I live on a little cul-de-sac. There's three of us, and one of my neighbors is um you know a, a gentleman um who must be in his I don't know, imagine late seventies at this point, right? And me and the other guy uh, wanted to uh, fix the cracks in the road because you know for him he didn't like driving over them. For me, it was, um, you know, my kids couldn't ride their bikes over them, right, when they were playing in the in the cul-de-sac. And, and the older guy wouldn't talk to me, but he talked to the neighbor and basically said, you know, and I said, well, this is only, you know, we'd said this is only going to last another four years. And the old guy says, well, then, you know, why would I care about that? I mean, he knows perfectly well he's not going to be there in that house in another four years. So why would he pay for the infrastructure? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, it, there, there is an interconnectedness between all of these things for sure. Um, so just to just to recap here with the infrastructure funding challenges piece, the the ex, the driver of change, the uncertainty, is around the level of funding and the cost to provide infrastructure of of some kind. So what do we think is the biggest story we want to be telling people at these public workshops at the end of March? Is it around transportation, water, all of the above? I think it needs to be all of the above. Uh, I think it would be a mistake to to split these out because they're all 
Now, I mean, there are a lot of ifs, ands, and buts in there, but like from the Water Commission's perspective, what we're we currently are have a have a stormwater deficit, and it's going to get bigger um, unless no flooding ever happens again. Um, and the the same department in the city is looking at a three hundred million dollar and probably five hundred million dollar by the time it happens uh, wastewater treatment plant that we haven't funded at all. There's no, no funding for that. Um, and that, you know, the, the road funds are, are inadequate. The, uh, we're looking at a surge in pipe replacements. We're going to have to start digging up every pipe in the city and replacing them over the next 30 years. That's a new expense because most of our pipes have been new until recently. So it's really across the board. Um, you know, the, all of the infrastructure we have, needs to be replaced it's crumbling and we don't have enough money the gaps are going to get worse and worse every year um so there's just there's a and this isn't an uncertainty though right so the certainty here is that we have a a multi-billion dollar uh, funding gap between even just basic minimal infrastructure costs that we can readily plan on um and and the current tax structure so that's certain the uncertainty is about whether we're going to be able to get more revenue or funding right so what's the federal government going to do are they going to pay for all of it are going are they going to pay for nothing because they go bankrupt or something um are we are we going to succeed in attracting large businesses to the community that will build our tax base up so we can pay for things. And this is part, part of our problem right now is that we don't have all of our major employers um, with one exception. They're all, they're all uh, public organizations that don't pay taxes. Right. So it's, it's the, it's the revenue side. That's the big uncertainty. I mean, I want to follow up on Ben's point, right? Because it, you know, the pie might grow a little bit every year, but um, it's generally it's, it's staying the same, right? So I think the uncertainty is not to Ben's point that we need more infrastructure and it's going to cost us more than it did on in the past. It's where do we have to take that money from to cover those costs? Um, because there's going to be a winner and there's going to be a loser. If it's becoming more and more certain that infrastructure has to be the winner, then the uncertainty is who's going to be the loser. Great, great stuff, everyone. Thank you for all of that. And uh, I want to just make is, sure Tyler gets a chance here. He's got his hand raised. Yeah, there were two thoughts I had to add. Um, on the first one, the first one for the cost of infrastructure, I'm curious, will the scenario planning take into account how different development patterns impact infrastructure costs? Um, as a general rule, compact development patterns require less roads, less plumbing, less wiring per person, making them relatively cheaper to build and maintain infrastructure for. And it's also generally true that residents of multifamily buildings use less water and electricity. So I'm curious if you'll take that into account uh, I'll let you answer that, then I'll go with the second thought. Yes, uh, we we are able to account for that in a general way, um, looking at things like road lane miles per per uh, per acre associated with different development types. Okay, and the second thought is, I just want to uh, mimic what Michelle stated in the chat that the real thorny issue here is how infrastructure is paid for. Uh, I agree with that. Absolutely. And I'm very pessimistic that the state of Arizona will come to any kind of healthy solution for infrastructure funding, like particularly when it comes to things like roads, uh, the issues of how to tax for these properly gets caught up in all these culture war issues. Like, any attempt to raise taxes um, equitably for to pay for roads, like with something like a VMT tax, or uh, you know more taxes based on the weight of the vehicle because it creates more wear and tear on roads, uh, would get caught up in these culture war issues 
be seen as like anti-freedom or something. So I'm just very pessimistic that we see a good solution come from the state with regards to infrastructure funding. And that may be the uncertainty that that we that we focus in on because that is is really something that we can't directly control. Um, I saw Ayano unmute, and I think it's because she wants to run this poll. And again, this is not the final say today, but we just want to kind of, based on this discussion, see if anyone's changed their, their mind about what the four are that they most want to focus on. Yeah, and I'll, so I created a new version of the poll that has collapsed mountain town exclusivity and climate driven migra migration into one, just since we talked about how those are intrinsically linked. Um, and it, I've also taken out um, so the water supply issues and decline in higher education. So we actually have now what a short list of four options. Um, and I will launch that poll now and ask you to choose up to three that seem most important. But I think based on a lot of the great insights and um, comments that have been having in this conversation, I think we're, we're already kind of finding ourselves narrowing and, and understanding a lot more of the nuance with some of these. So this is it's good that we had the time to discuss. Okay. So I'll leave this up for maybe 30 more seconds. Everyone kind of knows how to do this. We have about 50% who've already responded. Great, I'm going to close this poll in five, four, three, two, and one. Go ahead and end, and I will share the results with you all. Uh, so Alex, I'll let you go ahead and summarize, and then we can move on to our last segment of the meeting. Uh, so a lot of interest in, in the infrastructure funding piece um, and the mountain town exclusivity, a lot of agreement there. Um, and then it seemed, we didn't really talk much about the inaction on climate action, and that's that's my fault for not budgeting time enough to do it. but. Um, the chats, there was a lot of chats that came through that were very um, relevant to that discussion. Um, and then the aging shrinking population piece. So um, lots to unpack there. And we will send a recap of this that distills what we're thinking um, after, after this call uh, later this week. Um, and we will welcome additional comments like before um, on, that, on, on those uh, findings. Um, but I want to make sure we move on. And thank you all for, for your really good discussion on that stuff. Um, I want to move on and make sure we have time to talk about what this is all for. Um, so at the end of March, we will be uh, doing a series of uh, public meetings um, throughout the region, largely hosted by city and county staff, but with some support from the consultant team. And the... A uh, game, as we're calling it right now, is called Face the Future Flagstaff. Um, and the, the idea behind the game is that we want to give people the opportunity to um, address trade-offs and also um, address how they would want the region to grow if the, one of these four critical uncertainties that we land on was um, came to pass, if it, if it actually became, became a, a certainty. And uh, so the way that the game works is that there's a, a game board that's just a, a map of the region. Um, and the participants start by randomly selecting what we're calling a challenge card, which is one of these critical uncertainties that you all have helped to develop. And the challenge card is going to give them a prompt, basically say, in the future, Flagstaff grows much faster than we expected it would. And much of that growth is fueled by uh, tourism, climate migration, and the trend of work from home. And uh, so how would you create a scenario to address uh, a future where we grow more? And the way that they show that is um, through two major uh, inputs into the game. One is 
they are given a budget allocation um, where they can allocate it to different generic budget categories. So do you want more funding for uh, transportation or housing or uh, preserv uh, natural preservation? We haven't exactly settled on the categories yet, but that's generally how that's going to work. And then they'll also receive a preset amount of growth represented by different um, colored game pieces that represent different kinds of growth. So in this example with Mountain Town Exclusivity, which is still a working title, and we'll probably adjust it after today's conversation, um, they would receive a large growth allocation that they would have to then place onto the map. Um, they'd probably also receive a relatively large budget allocation with all that growth, and the growth being on the more affluent end of the economic spectrum. Um, and so by, by doing that, we are forcing them to consider trade-offs, but also to respond to a, a variable, the amount of growth, the amount of budget, it, within this, this context of there are wealthier second home oriented people moving to the region in larger numbers than before. Um, and uh, so the card that they get gives them uh, this, the, the, what, they sh what they play with. So it tells them how much budget and how much growth they get. And then we have sort of pre-measured out sets that they then get to place onto the map. Um, and as we mentioned, we'll be working with uh, the feedback that we received today to develop these four cards um, and, and, uh, and use that in the game with, with participants. Uh, and as I mentioned before, uh, they'll receive a budget allocation and a growth allocation, and then they'll be prompted to arrange those on the map as they see fit um, in small groups. Um, there'll also be the ability to trade out certain types of growth. So if you got a bunch of single family home development um, uh, game pieces in your allocation, you can trade those at a certain ratio for more compact growth, if you like. Um, so that'll be, be something that they also get to grapple with in terms of trade-offs. And then what we do is we take all of that information and we uh, digitize it and we try to find some consensus among different participants. So we'll have digitized maps from lots of different locations, different participants, different days of workshops all across the region. And then we'll consolidate that into, into some really interesting um, digital maps that'll tell us where people wanted to see growth. And we'll also be able to slice that information based on what challenge card they got. So for instance, if someone got a shrinking population challenge card, um, where would they want to see that smaller population go? Um, or if they got the mountain town exclusivity working title growth card, where would they want to see that increased population be accommodated? Um, so, uh, I think I'll, I'll pause there um, and hand it off to Ayano to finish off the, uh, this, and then we'll let you guys go at the top of the hour. Yeah, I also invite Sarah um, if there's any more detail or nuance on next steps for the um, tag. Uh, this tag groups communications, but um, I'll just say that we, um, you know, the next kind of charge we have is to bring this information to, to the public, as Alex was saying, through this uh, Face the Future Flagstaff game. And so that'll be kind of what March and um, April is focused on. So this tag won't be reconvening until uh, later in April. So Hopefully your schedules are open, but we'll send out communication for scheduling the third and fourth tag, tag meeting um, then. And, um, and I'll just highlight that these upcoming public meetings are ones that the city has already scheduled that you're welcome to drop into. Um, Sarah, if you wanna elaborate on if there's any RCPs or things like that, that people can look out for. But um, these meetings are being extended to anyone in the public to attend. They'll be facilitated by trained city county staff and consultants, and um, will be also attended by some of our CBO partners. Sarah, would you like to add more? 
Um, I think Jordan put in the chat, and it's important to note that the time, even on this slide, is incorrect. We we had it incorrectly published in one place, and it got copied into a bunch of places. But the one on Thursday, March 30th, is actually 6 to 7.30 p.m., so it's a little later. But because it's at the Aquaplex, we are able to provide child care if people RSVP in advance. So when we send out the notice, if you are forwarding it to anyone in your circle, make sure they know that we can um, accommodate families who have kids um, that they need to drop off. Um, I think also all of you are invited to come and actually attend these meetings, of course, um, even though our next technical advisory group meeting will be in middle to late April. Um, this is an important place. You can come and play the game. We sort of pick these times as like the breakfast club, the lunch bunch, the evening group, and a weekenders. So there should be a time that works for most people. Um, and I hope also we are also able to schedule this for other venues. So if you none of these work for you or you know of a group that would like to get together and do the game with staff, we would be happy to go to other meetings and roll this out. Our cutoff for that is probably going to be, um, what did we talk about? I have to look. April, like, the 18th or so will be the last day we'd be willing to actually schedule time to meet up in a, in a venue besides the Aquaplex with a group of whatever size. So um, please take a look at these dates. Um, would you would be willing to do it Flagstaff Shelter Services? Yes, absolutely, David. So um, we can you can start emailing me to get those kinds of things scheduled. Um, and that's it. All I have for, for the outreach part of it. Jordan and the crew are working on big press releases and advertising and all of that in the next couple of weeks. So it should start actually rolling out next week. Okay, well, great. Thank you, everyone, for your, your focus. Really loved all the conversations, um, especially the, the chat was very active, so we'll be combing through that. Um, and we will follow up with you on, on sort of a refined approach um, later this week. And uh, we'll, we'll say, uh, say goodbye for now. Thank you. Take care, Thanks, everyone. everybody. Bye -bye. Thank yeah. you.